self-harm and then some tips for responding. So the types of self-harm that, that are most commonly presented is, um, you know, burning, self-poisoning, head banging, biting, uh, hair pulling or, or skin picking as well, scratching or cutting. Um, so they're the kind of most common types of self-harm that, that present. So signs um, that somebody is self-harming then. And so, you know, quite often it, it can be difficult to, to spot signs and sometimes parents might feel really guilty or distressed that they mightn't have, have spotted um, self-harm sooner. That can be quite a common feeling. But again, sometimes signs are difficult to, 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 to actually realise um, that this is a sign of self-harm. So these are just some of the signs to look out for. Um, so, you know, unexplained cuts, uh, bruises, burns, bite marks um, or bald patches, keeping themselves covered up. So, for example, you know, um, really kind of hesitant, in, even if you're, they were going swimming, um, hesitant in doing activities like that, um, or maybe wearing, you know, long sleeves or really hot days or keeping their legs covered um, on really hot days or noticing any blood stained tissues and waste bins um, so these are all kind of signs to look out for alongside um, maybe changes in their mood so maybe they're appearing more depressed or withdrawn um, or withdrawn from family or friends um, so you're really noticing a change in, in their behaviors as well um, you know blaming themselves for, for problems or expressing feelings the failure or uselessness or hopelessness. So that internal critic becoming really, really strong. Um, outbursts of anger um, or argumentativeness um, and self-loathing or expressing a wish to punish themselves. So again, you know, if, if we take any of those last few points in isolation, you know, it, sometimes it's normal to have angry outbursts, you know, and, and particularly in adolescence that that can happen and that can be a normal part of adolescence as well. So it's kind of, you know, really looking out for, for the other piece around the unexplained cuts and bruises or, or, or as I said, that, that behaviour around kind of not wanting to, to maybe show their, their skin um, and, and noticing the bloodstained tissues. So they are just some of the signs to, to look out for. So, you know, why do adolescents self-harm? And again, particularly, you know, when parents present to, to PA, you know, this is something they desperately want to try and understand, you know, why? Is, is my child self-harming but I suppose the, the why can be quite complex and it can really differ from from child to child so you know we know that self-harm is a coping strategy um, for for the child at that point in time because that is what self-harm is it's helping them cope at some level with some overwhelm or distress and their body has been become a canvas to express that distress so you know when, when we look at it at that point of view it's really important that you know our first step is seeking to understand what self-harm is and that it is a coping strategy because then we can start to, to bid, build in help and support from there from, from that understanding so you know self-harm can help people initially you know manage emotions or you know reduce kind of distress in, in the short term um, or help them express how they're feeling um, you know, some people report that it helps them relieve an overwhelm or it's a release of some kind. Some people will report that the use of harm as a distraction from maybe other overwhelming emotions. Um, or it might help them gain a sense of control. You know, some people would say, I, you know, it helps when I feel out of control, it helps me feel more in control. Um, or for some people, it might be that, you know, the overwhelm is that they can't feel anything and actually self-harming is, is a way of helping them feel again so that that can be why they, they're doing it so as you can see it really varies from person to person the function behind the self-harm and again that's a really key piece when we're working with with a child or adolescent that presents with self-harm or an adult you know understanding the meaning and function behind self-harm is a really core part of of the therapy so some tips in responding as as a parent, if you, you know, if you have become aware that your child is, is self-harming, you know, it can be such an overwhelming and frightening place for you to be. So, you know, first step is just take a deep breath. You know, it, it, it is, it is 
such a, can be such a shock and shock and disbelief can often be the initial feelings that you will feel as well as maybe panic, sadness, distress. Um, so it's really, really important that, you know, you, you take that deep, deep breath, that you don't kind of dive in immediately into a conversation with the child, that, that you know, you just take a moment to, to you know, come in back into yourself, come back into a calm place, um, you know, get informed around and self-harm before you go in to have that conversation with your child and that's really really important because we know ourselves you know when we're kind of really activated and you know we're, we're in that panic mode ourselves we can't think straight so going in to have a, a conversation with your child in relation to self-harm that's not the best condition for you to have that conversation at that point in time at the same time you do need to act swiftly and don't ignore it so so, you know, take that time to compose yourself, but it really is important that, that this conversation does happen and, and you do speak to your child around whatever you've noticed or, or if somebody has told you something in relation to self-harm that you do actually plan that conversation. Um, being direct with the child can be really important as in, you know, don't be afraid to use the word self-harm. Um, the very act of you actually using the word self-harm can actually instill confidence in the child that if they are self-harming that you are able to hear this um, so that can be really really powerful as I said the timing of, of starting that conversation is really key so you know it's it's trying to um, avoid that kind of big chat and, and this really big lead into it so it might be around you know starting the conversation while you're out for a walk together or doing an activity together um, rather than you know this really big chat and also you know even doing it in a neutral space can be helpful so maybe not having the conversation in their bedroom you know a neutral space for them um, can be can be good as well um so focus on how they're doing without bombarding them for information so again it's completely normal to want to go into the why are you doing this but at this point in time your child might not know exactly why they are self-harming and actually by going in with that question and kind of really wanting to get the why, it can actually overwhelm them further and it can actually start to shut them down. So instead of kind of focusing on the why, it, it's it's really just going in in that real listening mode. Um, you know, listening is, is going to be one of the, the, the greatest gifts that you can give your child at this point in time. So whatever way you found out, um, you know, you could say something like to start the conversation, you could say, you know, your teacher told me that you've been hurting yourself. I'm really concerned for you and I want you to know that you can talk to me about it and let me help you. Um, or, you know, if you if you noticed, if it wasn't somebody that, that brought this to your attention and you, you noticed something, you could go in with what you noticed. So you might say, you know, I noticed a scar or scars on your arms or, you know, have you have you been self-harming? I'd really like to help you. You feel if you feel you don't uh, want to talk to me. I can set up an appointment for you to speak to somebody who can help. OK, so, you know, you are going in, you're being direct, um, but you're not going in with the wise. You're, you're going in with what you've noticed and you're going in with that supportive piece. So, as I said, you know, listening is really the first step. So listening to understand rather than listening to, to go in with a fix at this point in time. So, you know, you want to show it. Empathy. You want to, to, to let them know that, that you're with them, that you understand and that you're concerned. You want to stay curious without, as I said, going into that why and, and want to get that specific reason, because I said that can really shut them down at this stage. So you really want to kind of listen in order to understand, you know, if your child remains resistant, you know, let them know that you are really concerned for them and, you know, encourage, gently encourage them that you do want to to help them get help and support at this time. So if the child remains resistant and denies that there is a problem or that they are self-harming, as parents, you know, you are responsible for their physical and psychological welfare, and you're not betraying them by openly admitting that help is required. Um, so, you know, that's really important. If you've noticed something of concern, it really is important that you follow your instinct on that. 
project um, and that you know you work to, to put in the supports that are needed. So if they insist that they don't have a problem, um, tell them that you would like it, you know, an idea would be tell them that you would like it to be confirmed by a professional. And then give your child a few options of where you would bring them. And I know Keith is, is going to speak more about that um, after me. So without trying to make them feel guilty or obliged to see someone, ensure that your child is aware that you are concerned concern for them and see that they're in distress and that you really want to help and support them. OK, so you're really going in with that piece that, you know, you can see they're in distress. You are really concerned and you want to put that support in for them. It is important to take your child to the hospital or to the GP if they have injuries or wounds that require medical attention. And then kind of some help in, in the short term uh, for your child in relation to self-harm that, that you know you can help with is you know becoming more aware of how they feel when they self-harm and what's making them feel this way and what kinds of things you know will help empower your child to feel more in control can be really helpful and, and this can be a core part of the therapy process as well where you know you're, you're helping them understand the meaning and function behind the self-harm um, and this will hopefully help reduce the sense of being overwhelmed and feeling that they need to self-harm so you know the more they kind of understand um, the, the triggers what triggers them to, to self-harm can be really helpful so when the urge to self-harm does build in in the moment, having a list of other things that they can do straight away can, can really help, um, you know, in, in the intensity, intensity of that, that feeling to self-harm. So we, as, as I said, we understand that self-harm is a coping strategy. So it's really important that, you know, if, we, if we're working with the child to, to put in a new coping strategy, you know, we, what we want is really that self-harm is the last thing they go to as a coping strategy rather than and the first thing. Um, so I'm going to go through some strategies in a minute, but we just need to remember that different strategies will work for, for different um, children and adolescents. So it'll really depend kind of on, you know, whether it is that they want to, to use the coping strategy to, to burn off frustration or is it that they need to soothe or feel again. Um, so the different strategy will be tailored to whatever it is that, that, that um, that that the self-harm is kind of uh, doing for them so some young people will want to do something like soothing or like wrapping themselves up in a comfy space while others might want to to do something that's more active and burn off energy in their body so you know talk to your child about different strategies that they could try but also give them space to find their own ways of coping and figuring out uh, what works for them so collaboration is really important when we're putting in strategies because what I might think might be really effective in the moment the person themselves might not feel that that, that would help them at all so it really needs to, to to be driven by the child or adolescent so just some strategies that that can help um one is for some people having a self-soothe box so kind of having a box of um things that they can go to and access really quickly if that urge for self-harm is there so some elements in the box might be for example touch so having kind of material like play-doh for that sensory piece or a fidget cube um, or stress balls you know that can be a really way great way of kind of you know burning off that that, that stress that muscle tension um so and, and it can also help kind of help reduce anxiety so um that can be a really good thing to have in a self-soothe box Another one that can be really helpful is around, you know, triggering positive memories. So that might be, you know, photos of people you love or that you really care about, or it might even be photo of, you know, a place or a pet, whatever it is. Um, so something that evokes a positive memory. Um, smells, so again, going into the, the senses, um, you know, for some people, they find that having maybe peppermint for grounding or lavender for relaxation can really help um, music so favorite music um, and again whether the self-harm is you know that you self-harm to burn off an energy well then you might have music that that is 
loud and that, that, that helps you do that. Or if self-harm's function is to help soothe, then you might have soothing music that, that helps you to relax and get into that space. Um, having some breathing exercises there as, as a reminder during the moment of, of being able to, to do that and can be really helpful positive affirmation cards so favorite quotes um can be really good or even having something like your favorite chocolate or sweets in the self-soothe box can be really helpful so again self-harm is a coping strategy so we want something that's really easily accessed in the moment that they can put into place really really quickly so having a self-soothe box that you can access can be a really 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 helpful too for, for a lot of people but again it's not going to be for everybody so um it, it, you do need to, to tailor it to the person other strategies might be writing down um how they're feeling in a journal that can be really helpful for people um writing down difficult feelings and then ripping up the paper um you know or just ripping up a magazine or newspaper wanting to burn off that energy um hitting a soft cushion pillow or beanbag or listening, as I said, to soothing or loud music or having a shower. And, um, you know, sometimes if a person is feeling numb and they feel that they want to, to, to feel again, having a cold shower can, can be a really effective way of doing that. So there are just some strategies that can help. Um, other, I suppose the other core piece is around, you know, as a parent, this is a hugely stressful time. Um, you know, and as I said, the shock to Belief, panic, distress that that can come when you find out that that you know your, your child or adolescent is self harming. What can happen is you know they obviously become the forefront of your focus and attention because you you want to put support in place. But we know if if you are running on empty yourself, you know it's going to be really difficult for you to be able to to support your loved one because it does take energy. Um, so you know not forgetting yourself in this in that you need time out as well you need to still be able to maybe go for coffee with friends or or you know speak to somebody that you really trust that you're not holding all this in yourself and i always use this image around self-care because I, I i would say if i went around and everybody that's tuned in here this evening most of us would know what level our battery phone is at because we're quite clued into to our, our mobiles and the needs of our mobiles we plug it in every night we, we don't forget that but yet our own batteries can be run on empty and we can completely ignore it and particularly in times of stress we can go into that autopilot place so really important that you know if you are managing a situation and supporting a lot of them who is self-harming you know looking after your own self-care and doing those little things for yourself is really important because that's actually going to, to help you help them and have the energy to do that and i suppose just finally, to, to, for, for me to end on a note of hope, and that is, you know, if your child is self-harming or you are concerned, they might be, you know, as I said, it can be an incredibly worrying and upsetting time for you. But the important thing is that, you know, you and your child are not alone. You know, there are lots of services out there to support and help. And, you know, I know my experience in PETA, we see so many children and adolescents accessing our service, you know, and we see people move through self-harm and find other ways of coping and coping strategies so you know people can and do move on from from this time in their lives it's really important that you know we, we hold that hope um because you know people can get through this period so i'm just going to hand you over now to keith thanks Sinead. Uh, and i'll take over there now i'll just uh, share my screen if that's all right and um, and I suppose I'm going to talk a little bit and just follow on from what Sinead was saying uh, and just talk a little bit about accessing services over the longer term. I uh, hope everyone can see that there. And so and I'm just following exactly from what Sinead was saying that although people often come to webinars like this with a lot of questions like, well, where, how do I do it? How do I get something? How do I get help? Actually, maybe the place to start is with yourself. And that although all of the focus is going to go on your, on the young person in your life, and that's absolutely the most natural thing, but for you, your world has been turned upside down. And the whole family's 
world perhaps has been turned upside down and that this can be a deeply shocking thing that's happened. And so in order to do the things that you need to do in order to help somebody over the long term, you also need to spend a lot of time, you know, working for yourself and looking after yourself. And so how can you be calm, emotionally attuned, the therapist, the teacher, the parent, the nurse, if you're frightened and panicked and burnt out? And if self-harm is going on over the longer term, then actually those are some of the things that you're going to be asked to do. And so for you, part of this is looking for what professional supports can you get? How can you hold on to your own support network? Looking at your friends and family, because often self-harm has this shame about it. And we talk about any illness and we go and share it with our friends and we chat about it and gossip about it. But we can't somehow talk about mental health and we can't talk about self-harm. And sometimes that's because the young person doesn't want us to, but also sometimes we don't want to. And then we're carrying this thing on our own. And that makes it incredibly toxic. And it just eats away at us over time. And then all the normal things that we do that we need, sport and music and all of normal life. And all of those things should continue. And so a lot of the questions here are questions that we've been asked by parents as part of the research. And so one of the questions that we were asked was, how do I manage my own feelings, such as, such as worry or walking on eggshells? And it's incredibly hard to manage your own feelings in this situation. This is not a normal way for us to feel. It's not a normal situation to be in. No one has been trained as a parent in order to do it. And we're so concerned that we become overwhelmed. And so we can feel angry and guilty and ashamed and worried and not in control and lacking certainty. And that's just every day. That's not even in the moment of crisis. And all of that emotion has to go somewhere. And what tends to happen is if we're not doing something with it, positively day to day, then it comes out in the moment of crisis. And it sometimes comes out in a way that we mightn't want it to. And so people often neglect their own self-care because they're not the focus, the person, the child, the, you know, the young person needs the help. But one of the questions to ask is, well, what if I don't? What if I don't use self-care? And all of that emotion that comes out then in family dynamics, rows among partners, fights with the young person, a push and pull and a tug of war over seeking services, or the person's, you know, <clears throat> the parent's own burnout or ill health. And so sometimes we don't use self-care because a sense of I don't matter, it's in my child who matters the most and I need the care for them. Or I'll get by, I just keep going and keep going, and we go from crisis to crisis to crisis. But when we're doing that, what are we modeling? How, what are we showing the young person in terms of how to manage distress, how to manage difficult emotions, how to manage difficult periods in our life? And one of the things we, everyone kind of knows from parents is that kids don't listen to what we say, but they watch what we do. And if we can actually show them how to manage distress, show them what a healthy way of being with unhappiness and worry and all these difficult feelings are, that, okay, this is how you do it. And by showing them, they can actually learn how to do this for themselves, as well as all of the teaching and the telling and all of that too. But if they can see a model of how to do it, that that's really important. So in terms of seeking help, uh, and we talked about th this, a little bit already. It's important for anyone who self-harms to see their GP and the GP can treat a physical Ill injury as well as recommend further assessment. And they may be able to have a conversation with the young person that they mightn't share with the parent initially. And they'd be able to talk a little bit about, well, why did this happen or what's going on or what's going on in the background? Or while the parent may be aware of one thing, you know, there's something obvious, there may be something less obvious that's also happening in private and then seeking immediate help for injury or overdose or calling 999 if necessary. If you attend an emergency department, the, the young person will receive medical treatment. They'll get an assessment from a psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse. This assessment may take place over several meetings and to find out more about it so they can actually learn about well, what is going on for this young person and then a treatment plan hopefully will be decided. Though we know from 
experience that sometimes that doesn't always happen. And people can see a little bit more information and these links are up, up on Youth Mental Health website, but on hsc.ie. And so where you go and what you do is thinking through, showing that adolescent safety is essential in initial discovery. And what you're trying to work out is well, what's happened? What might the medical needs be? And all the typical services for physical health. So everything you would use for physical health. So your out of hours doctor, your GP service, your A&E. So in the same way that you would for any other physical health issue, those are the services you can attend. It's obviously deeply shocking in the moment when a parent sees their child hurt and we want to do everything to help. And there's a practical problem in that moment that needs to be solved. We're also trying to hold the emotional problem that probably can't be solved right in that moment, but can be held. And recognizing it's the, there's an emotional issue that ultimately has to be addressed, as well as whatever the practical needs might be. Sometimes a young person might refuse medical attention. And that's a very frustrating place for a parent to be. And listening and finding out what they need and exploring it with them. And it'd be very easy in that moment to get into a push and pull, into a tug of war. And trying to just listen and acknowledge and recognize the emotional place they are, they're in, as well as whatever the physical need might be. And as you're just trying to draw out of them as best you can, what's going on and why this might have happened and how they're feeling. And what we're trying to do is hold a sense of the emotional. So validate with love, warmth and concern, all of those things that are natural to us as a parent, which, which can be difficult in that moment of crisis, difficult in that moment of shock and horror and concern, but holding that. And so the first question might be, are you okay? It mightn't be a question at all, it might just be an expression of how much you love them and how much you're hoping that they're okay. And what this means is it increases the chance of accessing medical attention because it doesn't have to be an emotional battle. You're trying to get to their emotional, their emotional pitch, if you like. And so in Ireland, in terms of going for psychological support, this is generally accessed through GPs. And they're the gateway to CAM services and longer term assessment and intervention. And there's HSE information that we have a link to and NHS information. There's also Australian online training uh, for parents in, in managing parent, uh, young people who self harm. And that link is there as well. And um, so anyone who wants to link in, they can get that. And then Pieta and Jigsaw offer psychological support for self harm and suicidality uh, and self help for adolescents. And those websites are there and people can access those. And then there's many other services if there's particular needs for your young person. And our young people may initially refuse psychological support. And there's nothing surprising about that. Very few of us race off to see a psychologist. And I think most of us, most of us in our life when we're having stress or difficult, go, I'll be fine. I, I'll just keep going. I don't want to do it. And that's okay. And what you're trying to do is hold that, that the young person's desire not to do this thing. Maybe try and flesh out maybe some of their concerns. And a lot of them might be really reasonable. What if my friends find out? What if everyone thinks I'm a weirdo or anything? You know, and really validating those concerns because they're actually concerns that we as adults also have. You can talk to Pieta and discuss it with a therapist on their, their line and talk through this particular issues that are happening in your family. You can keep your GP updated and you might be able to get some advice from them. And keep the idea of a direction of travel. Someone doesn't decide, have to decide to seek help today as long as we're keeping an openness to a direction of travel. So holding that, that idea that they're refusing at the moment, but may have an openness at a later point. And if you think about anyone who's ever given up smoking, very few people give up immediately and never pick up a cigarette again. Actually, it's a process that takes a period of time before the person decides they finally want to quit. And often that's the same in terms of seeking psychological support. It's a process they have to go through to come to the conclusion, yes, this is something they want to do. And yes, this is something that they might need. 
And again, I think if anyone in the house can model that, actually, yeah, I go to a guy called Keith and he's kind of nice. And we have a chat and we meet him every couple of weeks and it's been good. Then actually that gives a sense of it being normal and it being normal within the family rather than the young person being somehow odd or, or, or different. And what you're trying to do is validate their worries, but also highlight the options that they might have. And just keeping that line of communication and direction of travel open. So in terms of treatments that might be offered, typical treatments generally involve the young person and a parent or parents meeting professionals uh, for an interview and a discussion about what might be going on. And so self-harm is a behavior. It doesn't tell us what's going on underneath. And what's going on underneath can be a, a hundred different things. Treatment may involve some or all of medication or psychological assessment or individual or group therapy or family therapy or school liaison. And it's a really hard role for a parent to be in because sometimes they're in the room and sometimes they're not. Obviously, the parent has a, you know, a really specific perspective on what's going on, but there's also then this other perspective that, and it mightn't, mightn't agree with the young person's perspective. And the two may really clash over that. And if you can, can keep collaborating with, collaborating with the professionals, keep communicating with the professionals, keep feeding in, because you're the person living in the house with the young person, keep feeding back in the information about what's happening. Is there a key worker or a key name that you can keep in contact with? And they may be able to share some information. They might not be able to share all information, but they can take, they can receive your information. And that's really important. That's really important for them. And somebody asked, do they need time off from work? And, and more than likely, most appointments are nine to five. Um, and someone else asked, would it be expensive? and lots of services, so HSE services, Pieta and Jigsaw are for free, but private therapy that some people might access is private and, and is expensive, especially if it's something that goes on over the longer term. And so in terms of parenting strategies, Sinead has talked through so, some fantastic parenting strategies. Um, I think one of the things to hold in mind is that self-harm is only a small part of your young person's life and all the natural things for positive parenting apply. So lots of TLC, food, sleep, friends, school, sports, hobbies, family events, family routines, trying to keep all of those things as much as possible. And it's easy for the focus to focus in on the terrible event or the risk of the terrible event happening again, but trying to keep normal life going as much as possible and allowing the person to opt in when they can, but that the option is always there for them. And then tailoring it, if there's something that needs to happen to help them, to help them to be engaged with this. Talking to the young person about what support they might need, they may have an idea um, for what that might be. And there's some links for talking to the young person included in, in this slide. And what you're hoping for most of all is that it's a collaborative process. You don't have to solve it for them, best of all, if you can solve it with them. And so trying to listen and find out what they might need, acknowledging the pain and just kind of managing that very delicate line of both acknowledging it and recognizing it and, and the right amount of being intrusive. Trying to understand the severity of their distress and self-harm is often an expression of a very intense inner turmoil. And you're trying to have an open environment that the first conversation mightn't be where everything comes out. The 10th conversation mightn't be where everything comes out. But by the 11th or the 12th, maybe the person comes back and starts to drop things in when they feel able. Talking about self-harm and talking about it really openly, naming it. Pretending it doesn't exist doesn't make it go away and it often reinforces a sense of shame and secrecy. And um, well, we all know that shame is just this toxic thing. It pushes everything good out. And so when there's shame in a household around something that's happening, then the, the young person, of course, picks up on that. And, and as you do too. And you can ask, you know, if you think something is up and you think, oh, they're not having a good day, ask, do they feel like self-harming today? And you, you might get a straight answer and then you may be able to intervene in advance.
is there something I could do to strengthen my relationship? And trying to improve the parent-child relationship is in all the normal ways. So you're trying to build a better open supportive relationship, which I think is a huge challenge in adolescence anyway, but it's also something your parents are trying to do in adolescence anyway. And all the things you were trying to do, you keep doing. Bring both parents along if there's a second parent uh, involved, if this is possible. And that's so that you're not the only parent holding the responsibility for it. And we often know that mums are the primary people who are involved in ringing GPs and following up services and all of that. And often they're holding all the responsibility. And actually as much as possible that if there's two parents, that two parents are involved in talking about this in working on it, on thinking about it, on reflecting on it, on the different perspectives that might be on it. And so as much that this, you have support in the household uh, for this difficult situation. There's lots of supportive parenting strategies out there. And one program is the Parenting Plus program. And there's a, a link to their website there and you can have a look. Uh, and that's a free parenting support uh, training program. There is the National Self-Harm Forum for Advice and, and that's online and people can have a look at that. Um, and there is DBT Skills for Adolescents and there's another link attached for that. And DBT Skills are a lot of what Sinead was, was talking about. It's how do we manage our difficult emotion in the moment? So how do we self-soothe, self emotionally regulate? How do we do difficult interpersonal interactions? How do we use mindfulness? How do we use distress tolerance in that very crisis moment when we need to kind of just reduce, reduce our emotional reactivity? And really, really focusing on the ordinary, pizza and Netflix. The young person wants to feel ordinary. They don't want to feel different. They don't want to feel weird. They don't want to feel odd. And often the normal things are the things that will ground them if we can hold on to that. Is there something you can do to make it feel better? And how do I manage these feelings that I should fix it? And essentially, no, you didn't cause it and you can't fix it. And even though it's our deepest urge as a parent, especially in our child's time of crisis, to fix it, to make it go away, to make it better, actually, it's not something we're able to do. And our whole life, when our kids are small, we're able to fix their problems and they, they hurt themselves and we pick them up and we rub them and, you know, we tell them it's going to be okay. And often, you know, 90% of the time, that's enough. But actually, as children age, we're not able to fix their problems. We can only be with them as they're going through their problems and try and support them. So parents can only do what they can do. And self-harm has many different trajectories. Sometimes it's just a one crisis point and people are out of it within and they never go back. There's a middle category who might come back to it, you know, incrementally. And then there's a small group of people who frequently go back and self-harm over time. And it's like a physical illness. We can't fix it. We can be a guide. We can be a support. We can be with the person. But I think as a parent, we hold this huge responsibility and we often blame ourselves that we are the cause. And it's just not the case. But we can help the young person try and think it through. We can do a bit of detective work. Is something happening or something outside the home? Is there bullying, exclusion, trauma? Have they experienced something awful maybe in their lives? And we can't make the emotions go away but we can help them to be with their emotions. And in terms of that, the best thing we can do is model how we are with our emotions and actually show them how to be with, with, with difficult things. Often there'll be other children in the family. So how do we tell our other children and what we do? And slightly that depends on the family and how it's structured. But self-harm is generally not something that only happens for the young person, it happens to the whole family. And even if the other sibs aren't aware, you know, consciously aware, they're probably picking up on all the vibes. And so it's really important to address it in some way. And guilt and shame and secrecy generally add to the difficulty. But when and how you tell depends on the other children and their needs and what's going on for them. And it's easy for them to feel very responsible or worried. And you'd often see a much younger sibling feeling responsible for an older adolescent sibling 
and worry that they may have caused some self-harm or something. So depending on the situation, including the young person, the way the, the others will be told. So asking the young person, how would you like your siblings to know? What would you like them to know? How are, how are we going to talk about this as a family? Having an open conversation around how this might work rather than, okay, making a, a, a black and white decision. The young person is going to have to deal with it probably somehow anyway, because there's going to be a nosy sibling if it comes out, who's going to ask about it, be wondering about it, be unsure about it. And, and it's going to be this question in, in the family. And I mean, you highlight your own concerns about protecting younger children and how you feel they should be protected. And the other siblings have their needs too. And in these moments of crisis, it's very easy for them to get neglected. And sometimes there will be a key bit about reminding ourselves, oh, actually, you know, John has exams <laughs> this year. You know, we, we have to focus on them, even if that seems much smaller than, than the, the other crisis. And so there's lots of factors that are going to influence um, how and when you tell um, the other siblings. But it's just keeping in mind that openness is probably the best strategy. And so there's a, that's a short list of the resources there, but there's a much longer list uh, on the Youth Mental Health website and uh, if anyone wants access um, to these slides. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Keith and Sinead, for those really fantastic presentations.